Honey, they shrank the scientist. Kind of gives a new meaning to a molecular biologist. So a couple of uh, years ago, one of my students asked me uh, why I decided to become a scientist. And, and I found that question rather odd because I realized in retrospect that I had never decided to become anything. Actually, it just sort of happened to me. And, and further, it seemed odd because I was always a scientist. I was born a scientist, just like all the rest of you were also born scientists. I mean, who among you have not had the experience as a baby sitting in the pram, uh, pushing the bottle out onto the floor, and as it tumbles down, much to your mother's delight, you've discovered gravity. <laughs> and then the responsible adult in your life picks it up and puts it up again, and you knock it back over, and you replicated the experiment. <laughs> and what happens is you start to get feedback about this. Stop throwing the bottle. Stop making messes. And it sort of it, it pulls us back a little bit. Sometimes people feel a little bit more reluctant to try these, to try these uh, experiments out. But I didn't. Uh, how, when I was in, in uh, grade school, like in grade two, I would be given homework in class, like many of the students in here are, I'm sure, get the same thing. And uh, I would finish early and then make myself a royal pain in the derriere, uh, messing up the class. And so then the teacher would send me to the learning center, which is where people who uh, need help go. So I go to the learning center, and it, these are boring places. They had little colored blocks you could move around. It just was not my scene. So I would go where an inquisitive person would go, which is under the sink, <laughs> and pull stuff out. And I'd be mixing potions. And one day, I'm missing potions, and I get this one. It was amazing. It smelled just like a pina colada. I don't know how I knew that was a pina colada, but it smelled just like a pina colada. And so I brought it to the, to the, uh, the learning aide and said, hey, smell this. <laughs> Pull my finger. And so it smelled the, 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 the tube. I was like, wow, that's amazing. That smells, that smells like coconut with a little citrusy top note. Why don't you take it to your class and show it to them? So I went back to the class. And I showed my teacher, and she was impressed, and had all the students in the class come up, and they're all sniffing my magic potion. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, I didn't realize I was gassing them. I came home that night for dinner, told my parents about this, and my dad's like sitting there with his head in his hands. He's like, you were making chlorine gas. Don't do that. <laughs> Bad idea. Now, it could have ended there. I could have you know, felt kind of pushed back a little bit, and maybe I'm not going to mess with it. But my folks did something different. They, they bought me a chemistry set. And they said, here, blow stuff up in the backyard. Don't gas your, 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 your um, classmates. But other people, sometimes they, they don't have that feeling. And in fact, when they uh, find themselves in these situations where they try stuff out and maybe it doesn't work, uh, they, they feel threatened or the possibility that they'll get negative feedback or will be perceived as not being as smart or as, as successful. And, and this is especially true of people who are uh, very bright and aspirational, who imagine that they could be almost anything so long as nobody catches them for being the fraud that they are in their inner core, because they are not perfect. Um, so for instance, I know this, this young woman, she's truly an, uh, an impressive lady now. Um, as a child, she was identified early as having special powers. I mean, she was speaking in complete sentences when she was nine months old. It was like talking to E.T. And uh, before she started school, you know, instead of, of, of bedtime stories, she would ask for math problems, which she would do in her head and all that. And then got to school and it was put in special programs and all that good stuff. And something strange started happening. I mean, she would go into the class and she was rocking. She could do amazing things, but her grade point average wasn't very good because uh, she actually got two grades. She either got perfect marks or A pluses or she got Fs. That's it, A's and F's, FF. And, uh, and so the overall GPA was not so impressive. And it's like, well, Shay, um, what's going on with that? And, and what was going on was that she was so terrified of, of being wrong, of making a mistake, of being seen as not being perfect, that if she could not formulate the answer completely in her head, a priori, and then render it in complete glory by itself, she just wouldn't do it at all. And that, that is something that really uh, caused her a lot of trouble. And it extended outside of the classroom, too. If you went into a store and there's 20 different types of shoes, and they're all beautiful shoes, and they're all perfectly adequate shoes, and you could randomly pick a pair of shoes and put them on her feet, and it would be fantastic. She'd be paralyzed, paralyzed by indecision, 
This is called option anxiety. She had all these great choices, and they were all perfectly fine. But the problem was, if she selected a pair of shoes, all those other 19 pairs of shoes, well, maybe they would have been better. And so she'd pick no shoes and would walk out of the store with no shoes at all. This is a, a general trait I see often in people, especially people who are, are aspirational and, and wish to do well and are quite good to begin with. And uh, this sort of option anxiety, if anything, I would imagine would extend even more to scientists than, than others because the universe is a huge place filled with many opportunities, many different ways of viewing things. You might get it wrong. We get it wrong all the time. But we have uh, something to help us out. And what helps us out is that science, actually everything, it's not just science. You can just replace science with almost anything else the rest of you guys do, and it's cool. Uh, science is bounded by rules, rules that are social, they're cultural, they're historical. We have contracts, and they bind us together in such a way that it limits our options. What is an acceptable way to do things? What are good problems to solve? What is constituting a good solution to a problem? Science is bounded by culture and history. These bind help us see patterns. They help us discover wonderful things. At the same time, it also shackles us to prior history, sometimes in ways that cause us to make mistakes, mistakes that ultimately we can capitalize on, which I hope to illustrate for you today. As we argue with one another, trying to figure out what is correct within the bounds of our, of our agreements, we end up in these struggles. Um, this one is a faculty meeting recently. And, and by argument and discussion, we come up uh, with some sort of mutually agreeable terms that uh, push science forward. So I'm going to tell you about this process in the context of two stories. They're both based in the same, uh, same general milieu, that of the germ theory of disease. In the 19th century, Louis Pasteur, after whom the Pasteur Institute is named, and the Pasteur pipette that we use in my laboratory, uh, Louis Pasteur was working in the brewing industry, and they were trying to figure out how invisible agents of change, we beasties, uh, in, a, in a syrupy sauce, could transform it into an effervescent, delicious adult beverage to be responsibly enjoyed by some people, but not everybody in the room. And, <laughs> at least not now. And, 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 and while he was doing this, he came upon an amazing idea that there are things that we cannot see that, that are beyond our comprehension right now that can transform matter and turn it into something completely different. That idea caught the attention of Koch in Germany, who said, well, these invisible agents of change, we call them microbes now, these microbes could also change the human body. For instance, a microbe could make you sick and cause dis-ease. He was studying tuberculosis. He showed that you could take somebody with tuberculosis and take their ooey-gooey, sticky, icky substances out of their body and smear them on some other person, and they would get TB. Do that today, and you go to jail. But that was a, a considered to be a very high bar that marked how we determine if an infectious disease is in fact caused by a, a specific microbe. Now we call it Koch's postulates, but it's been modified somewhat because, again, this is terrible behavior to do that to another human being. But this idea that invisible agents of change could alter the human body and cause disease was so potent that for decades later, people interpreted everything they did in light of that general idea, whether or not it was a good idea. A break. Since I'm a teacher, we have a quiz. What is penicillium known for? Anybody? Well, penicillium is that fungus that you see growing on the petri plate. On the left side of this panel, what you see is an agar growth medium, and sprinkled on top of it were some spores of a mold, penicillium, the green parts are the spores, and the white parts are the mycelial mat that's growing out of it. Now, these, these, these molds are used to do many things. For instance, they make delicious blue cheeses. Um, sometimes, if you're not fastidious, the bread in the back of your refrigerator might grow it as well. Well, it also is the source of antibiotics, which brings us to our first story, um, which is about how being a slob can make you do wonderful things. 
And this is the story of a Scotsman, uh, Alexander Fleming, who was in London at the time, and he was working in his messy laboratory on, in the context of Koch's postulates and the germ theory of disease. He said, well, if we are in fact surrounded by microbes that are potentially beating up on us all the time, we must have some way to fight back against that because we're not sick all the time. Not all of you in the room are sick right now. Some of you are, sorry, Tom. And <laughs> as a consequence, maybe we have something in our bodies that could protect us. So what he would do is he would take all the ooey-gooey, icky, sticky parts of the human body, all the exudates and liquids and sticky stuff, and he would start exposing bacteria to them. So we're looking at another agar petri plate here, and spread on it is a bacterium called Staphylococcus, which can sometimes cause disease. What you see is the white is where the bacteria are growing. And then there's a zone of clearing in the center, and in the very center of that is a white filter disc. On that filter disc was placed a tear. You see, in our tears, there is an invisible agent of change. It's called an enzyme. This one's called lysozyme, and it lyses the bacteria. And he published a paper called On the Lytic Action of Tears, and he became very famous for this and got in the Royal Society, and he got a raise and a better office, and he packed up his family and said, we're going to France. And they went on holiday, but he didn't clean his lab. And while he was gone, he had all these Petri plates stacked up, and uh, some mold spores were floating around and stuff, and one of them landed in a petri plate where he was growing the Staphylococcus, and when he came back to clean up the lab, he saw something. He said, I've seen this before. I recognize this pattern. And where the fungus had fallen down, there was a zone of clearing that stopped the growth of the bacteria. And in so doing, he transformed human history because he was a slob. He wasn't just a slob. I know all the mothers out there are hating me. So he was not just a slob. He, he had prepared his mind by trying, by doing experiments. He did a lot of experiments, and he saw patterns, and those patterns had meaning, and then he could superimpose those patterns into new environments, some of them created not by design, but by accident. It was a happy accident that led, ultimately, to the discovery of antibiotics, which has transformed human history. Tens of thousands, hundreds, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of individuals are alive and have been alive as a consequence of being treated with antibiotics. In the war years when this was first rolled out, it was super important because it helped people who had injuries in the battlefield not uh, fall from their injuries. So that's our first story. The second, oh, another quiz. What's Barry Berry? Anybody? Yeah, it's a smoothie, right? So, Barry Berry means I can't. I can't. It's a horrible disease. It starts out as a peripheral neuropathy with tingling in the fingers and the toes, and eventually it spreads throughout your body and you become weak and can't get up anymore, and then at some point your heart will stop beating. It's a terrible disease. And this is the story of a, of a physician from uh, the Netherlands who moved to this place right here, Java. Isn't it beautiful? I would love to visit sometime. What you're looking at are terraced rice fields. And uh, rice features into this story quite a bit. So, so when Eichmann was in Java, he was studying because he was into neurology. He was studying people who had beriberi. And what they noticed is that folks that were in asylums, in prisons, who were on ships for long periods of time, in close quarters, were getting this disease. And he said, that sounds like a germ is causing it, because he came from Koch's lab, and he was infected by the idea that microbes are the guys that cause all the diseases. So he started looking for a microbe that would cause this. And because it was not a good idea to be doing this on humans, he switched to chickens. And he had chickens in his yard, and he would feed them rice. And he noticed something. He would take a sick chicken, and he would try to isolate the ooey-gooey parts of it or just put the chicken together with well chickens and see if they could transmit the sickness. And he, he was not getting that to work. It was really frustrating him. And furthermore, sometimes chickens that were not exposed would suddenly get sick. And he just couldn't understand it. Well, it turns out, the chickens were being fed leftover rice from the hospital next door. And when they were feeding the chickens brown rice, they were fine. And when they were feeding the chickens white rice, they would get sick. 
on further inspection, he found that if you took the hulls that are discarded when you mill brown rice and make white rice out of it, when you take those hulls and add them back to white rice, it would protect the chickens from getting sick and it could cure a sick chicken. And he said, I've got it, I know what this is. The white rice has a toxic microbe in it that is killing chickens and people. And, and that the brown rice has an antitoxin that is fighting against that toxin. And he published on this and it changed the diets of people and it affected human health in a huge way and he was celebrated. He went back to the Netherlands and instead was joined uh, in his place by a guy named Gert Greens who uh, saw that actually Eichmann was dead wrong. It was exactly the opposite. It wasn't that white rice was hurting the chickens because it had something toxic in it. It's because white rice lacked something that the brown rice had that it needed. They discovered vitamins. The vitamin is B1, and in the absence of B1, you get this peripheral neuropathy. It's easy to treat, and it has established vitamins as an important component of our diet, again, that has transformed human health. And that occurred initially because of the hard work of Eichmann, which led to an incorrect idea that was corrected by somebody else in this case. Uh, interestingly, Eichmann won the Nobel Prize for this, even though he never believed it to be true. He stuck by his guns. Greens did not. He did not. He, he passed away before it was offered. But Eichmann also got recognized because he invented uh, using surrogates, models for human disease to try to study them. So what's the point? The point is that in both of these cases, scientists goofed up. In their practice, they generate data and observations that can be applied to try to make sense out of things. But the sense is the product of rules that limit them from their culture. Sometimes these ideas are incorrect. Sometimes they are misled. But it's through trying to correct these errors or taking advantage of the happy accidents of being a slob that great insights can be made. And this will only occur if you throw yourself into harm's way that the perfect people are going to have to need to seek out opportunities that, that stress them out, where it's going to be bad, it's not going to work out. Nine out of ten experiments we do in the lab don't work, or they don't tell us what we think. But in revising that, trying to deal with the error and move beyond it, we incrementally approach goodness of perfection, that asymptote that we will never actually intersect with, but through our collective efforts, make it a little bit better. Thank you for your attention.